Hey, A.V.
It is a very musical service, and we've got a phenomenal message coming to us later in the service. So, um, does anybody need anything before we? Another hymnal. Another hymnal. Which one? Gray. Good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Congregation. Yeah. It is great to see all of you here and also to see those that are joining us online. We are going to get started with our service in singing, Going to Lay Down My Sword and Shield, otherwise known as Down by the Riverside. So feel free to sing along, feel free to talk with your neighbor if you want, or stand whatever you'd like. <laughs> Down my sword and shield, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield, down by the riverside, I'm going to study me more no more. Ain't gonna study, ain't gonna study more. 
feel something so wonderful, so wonderful in this place. Let's go ahead and sing 168, one more step. And for those of you joining us, come on in. There's plenty of seats up here in the front. <laughs> One more step. One more step. We will take one more step till there is peace for us and every step. We'll take one more step. One more word. One more word. We will say.
feel that spirit in this place? Do you feel that? Go ahead and reach out to your neighbor. Reach out to those you haven't seen in a while. Reach your neighbor and say, hello. Thank you for coming. We love you. You are welcome here. It's because my mic was muted. <laughs> it was a human error. Mine. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I am the Reverend Ali Casey Bell. My pronouns are he, they, and if you just can't seem to get that, <laughs> you may address me by my title, the Reverend, that's my title, <laughs> Ali. <laughs> I'm one of the ministers serving this religious community with my colleagues, the Reverend Abi Janamanchi and Dana Edwards, and our music ministry director, Adam Graham. And we have with us today the Reverend Dr. Kristen Harper, the minister at the Unitarian Church of Barnstable, Massachusetts. And she's been the minister there for the last 20 years. She, yeah. Also, she's very special to me because Kristen was also my very first UU minister. 25 years ago. Kristen is one of the reasons I'm standing here today. I'm so delighted to have you here. If you aren't aware, chapel is happening. Children's chapel or family chapel is happening just around the corner in the other room. Um, and our family chapel is happening. It happens just to about uh, 11 o'clock. If you can see on the screens, Reverend Dana is there now. They're doing some wonderful things there. It's a lot of fun. I love, love, love uh, family chapel. It's just like the congregation here. They uh, have a message and they uh, collect the offering. They do joys and sorrows. It's just... Um, just more uh, faith formation for our families and, and children. So, whoever you are, wherever you come from, whoever you love, whatever your beliefs, your gender identity, your documentation status, and disability, and whether you're joining us in person or if you are joining us online, you are welcome to bring your full whole, imperfect self here. A special welcome to those of you who are new to Cedar Lane this morning. 
If you're joining us for the first time today, or you still feel a little newish, please raise your hand in person or add your name in the chat online. And let us give you a warm Cedar Way Lane welcome. Anyone new here today? Thank you so much for choosing Cedar Lane. We know that there are so many places that you could have chosen. And hello, friends who are new online. Thank you for choosing to be with us. We know there are so many places that you could have gone today. You're invited to complete the newcomer forum that will be linked in the chat. Join me after service in the library to learn more about Unitarian Universalism and Cedar Lane. Our weekly e-newsletter is a great way to stay updated about happenings at Cedar Lane, and you can sign up through the link on our website at our homepage, www.cedarlane.org. <laughs> our pastoral visitors are an extension of our ministry team, and Mala Wedberg is our pastoral visitor today. She's available to support you in person. Thank you, Mala, for everything that you do. Cedar Lane UU Congregation is situated on the ancestral lands of the Nakashtank people, part of the Piscataway group of tribes, and on the land of, on which enslaved African people and their descendants labored and lived without choice or reward. We honor with gratitude the land and the people who have protected it through generations. We gather in gratitude to all who have gone before us, whose love and labor helped create and sustain this mission and ministry of this religious community. And I just want to say many of you have been part of that community. In this spirit, we gather. And in this spirit, we begin. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Barb Warman, your worship associate for today. My pronouns are she, her. As Shira Ehrlich of our racial justice ministry team kindles the chalice, a symbol of our shared faith and gathered community, please share in the chat where you are lighting your chalice from. Please rise in body and or in spirit to share the chalice lighting words. We kindle the chalice, symbol of freedom, sacrifice, and community. We remember those who have gone before us, who spoke against tyranny and oppression, and led the way in promoting justice, equity, and peace. We dedicate ourselves to be parts of that stream of light, awakening light within ourselves, and working for peace and justice in our world. Please remain standing to sing hymn 1030 in the Teal Hymnal. I want them to hear us in D.C. I want them to hear everyone. Let's sing. See ya, Hama.
My goodness. All right, somebody put a praise on it. All right. <laughs> so, we have a number of announcements to uplift this morning, and they're all pretty important. So first and foremost, I just want to say that I was pretty impressed with the participation in the sanctuary and online with the vote that you all made to change the name. The voting on our future um, with the changes of uh, the name. By over two-thirds vote, our, our name is now Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Congregation. But I think that what's even more important than that is that it was done in a loving way. People were heard. It wasn't perfect because, as you know, I say it's about perfection. It's about connection and not perfection. So everything didn't go perfectly. But people were heard and people got to vote. And we left in a way that we had a name that most people could agree on. So, kudos to you. Also, we got an update on our construction finances. They were presented and approved. A motion was had to affirm the congregation's support of any necessary financing up to, amount, up to the amount of construction budget. So, our construction begins soon. Like, you're gonna blink your eyes and be like, why are we covered in dust? <laughs> this month, for three weeks, Reverend Abhi Janamanchi is leading a pilgrimage in India with a group of our members and other members from UU congregations nearby. We wish them all safe and a transformative experience. And tomorrow, I'm so proud of our youth, tomorrow, January 16th at 10 a.m., the youth will participate in a day of service right here at Cedar Lane. They're prepared to show how love works in their congregation by packing and preparing things that will help other youth feel loved and cared for. And all they need is the support of this congregation. That's all they need to realize their project. So you still can check out the e-news and bring what they ask for, and it's not much. Just bring what they need. There are signs all over the congregation. You can bring it at 10 a.m., you can bring it through Monday, you can bring it later today. Help the youth realize their project goal. And this year's benefit concert is entitled Symphony of Songs. Our reproductive justice team selected the DC Abortion Fund as our beneficiary. And I am thrilled. As we know what's been happening in our nation, we know that the DC Abortion Fund needs help. It provides many vital services to our community. DCAF faces a multitude of state and national restrictions designed to deny access to abortion care. These restrictions disproportionately affect low-income people, and together we hope to make choice a reality. Because we believe a person's right to health care should not depend on their wallet. And I don't know about you, but that seems like a loving action that we can take. The concert will be right here at Cedar Lane on Saturday, January 28th at 7 p.m., the last Saturday of the month. You'll need to get here early so you can get those exact seats you want. You know how we are about our seats. We want to sit where we always sit. And if you want to sit where you always sit, you got to get here early. All right? And then, just because we all believe in expanding our minds and the ways that we work in the world, January 22nd, 
The eighth principal empowerment group will host an event from 12 to 2 at the Chalice House, which is just right up that hill if you're new, uh, still on our property. UU seminarian and disability activist Heather Petit will be their guest and food will be provided. We now move into a space of naming and sharing the joys and sorrows of this community and beyond. So let us enter into that space. If you're new and don't know, we have a joys and sorrow table over here. You're invited to light a candle for whatever's on your heart today. Let us center ourselves and enter into this moment, calling upon all the sources of love that are within, among, and around us. We lift up those in our community who are living through significant passages the small and extraordinary milestones of life. We pause to be present to our spiritual companions and to the concerns of our own hearts. Within our Cedar Lane community, Annette Scarpita and her family appreciate your prayers, cards, and emails following the death of her mother in December. A celebration of life service for longtime member Kay Scott will be held on Saturday, February 18th at 2 p.m. Kay passed away peacefully at Sibley Hospital on December 22nd at the age of 105. The service will also be live streamed on our YouTube channel. Our caring extends beyond Cedar Lane to others whose lives are lost and whose lives are impacted by war, violence, and calamities in our nation and in our world. May these friends of ours, our companions in the world, and all the joys and sorrows we hold in our hearts be held in the embrace of silence. As we enter the silence together, you are invited to rise in body and or in spirit and speak the names of the loved ones that you are holding in remembrance or share their names in the chat. I invite you into the spirit of prayer and reflection. Come by here, divine spirit of love and justice. Arise amongst us and burn deeply in our hearts. In our brokenness, we have failed to move down the path of healing. In our hubris, we have failed to recognize our role in the crisis now as ensnaring us, a crisis that the Reverend Dr. King gave his life to avert. We are grateful for the reminders of our ancestors and our companions of all faith, reminders to be and do better than we have yet done. 
reminders to reach out to those on the margins and encircle them, reminders to stand up for what is just and right, reminders that we do have power and influence, and to stand back is to stand with complicity. We know that it is not up to the holy to make the changes we seek, but it is in the transformations we undertake that the holy works through us. The beloved community your servants spoke so eloquently about will not become solely by dreaming. We are called to be courageous and to look at where we ourselves are too comfortable, too willing to let things go, too willing to go along. We are called to leave our safe niches and enter into the world, to reach across faith and politics, race and ethnicity, class and ability, gender and sexual orientation, and seek beyond the hurt and confusion, the anger and despair, to bring hope and comfort, to bring compassion and understanding. We are called to organize resistance to that which would oppress parts of our society, that which would pit us against one another, that which would keep us all apart and sit in, stand out, protest and march, raise our voices in love so that the whole world might hear our mighty cry. Come by here, spirit of love and justice. We are open to your call. We are ready to commit. We are infused with your presence. Come by here, God. We are ready. Amen. Today we share the plate with Impact Silver Spring. Today we share the plate with Impact Silver Spring. The director of this organization is here to share more information about their work. Their work. Welcome, Mr. Rubin. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Rubin. I um, currently serve as the Interim Executive Director of Impact Silver Spring, and it really is an honor and pleasure to be here with you this morning on this very important weekend. Thank you so much for your support of our work. We do appreciate it. Let me share a little bit about what we do. Impact is committed to bringing about a more racially just and economically equitable Montgomery County by working for change at the individual, neighborhood, and systems levels. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, 
We launched our Green Space Initiative to enhance local food security and increase the practice of environmental stewardship while co-creating a neighborhood community garden in Kensington, Maryland. Since that time, Impact Green Space has partnered with local urban farms, schools, and local government institutions in the area in order to co-create green infrastructure and sponsor conservation landscaping in both neighborhood and school gardens. We currently sponsor a school garden in one Montgomery County Elementary School and offer a workforce development training program for community land stewards so that they can gain employment within the emerging green economy. We believe that locally accessible community gardens and biodiverse green spaces are a critical component of sustainable agriculture and can increase community members' health and well-being and may be able to help mitigate some of the worst effects of climate change in our community as well. Impact is currently working to identify site and build a garden in the East County area of Silver Spring, where residents have called for increased opportunities for neighborhood connections. We're also in the process of developing a community garden site uh, at the Glenmont community of Silver Spring, right next to the fire station on Randolph Road and Georgia Avenue, uh, with, in cooperation with the local civic association and Montgomery County's Department of Environmental Protection. As Impact Green Space continues to grow, its capacity is expanded towards design, co-creation, maintenance, and exploration of diverse green spaces throughout Montgomery County. We see this process as an emergent transformative justice approach to develop communities that are thriving, environmentally friendly, and economically sustainable. Thank you so much for your support of this work, and I wish you all a beautiful day. You can text to donate CLUCC with the amount to 73256 or donate online to the bit.ly link Cedar Lane Give Now and choose collection plate. You can give using PayPal or go to Cedar Lane PayPal or scan the QR code at the bottom of your order of celebration. You can mail a check to Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Congregation at 9601 Cedar Lane, Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you for your generosity. Today's offering will be greatly received.
This morning is from a letter from a Birmingham jail by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to the positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright, re outright rejection. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. I had hoped the white moderate would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phrase, phase of transition from obnoxious negative peace in which the Negro passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out into the open where it can be seen and dealt with, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it's covered up, but must be open with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. American side 
Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous peaks of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and every molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. I have a dream. When all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today.
On April 12, 1963, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led a Good Friday demonstration in Alabama to shed light on the brutal racist treatment being inflicted on the blacks in Birmingham. Civil rights organizers had invited Dr. King to support their cause after months of an organized boycott of the city's white-owned businesses had failed, and negotiations with business owners had led to no permanent changes. Ignoring the recently passed prohibition of public gatherings without a permit, King and 50 other protesters and civil rights leaders were arrested during a peaceful demonstration. King was put in solitary confinement, denied access to his attorney and his wife. A friend of Dr. King smuggled into him a copy of April 12th Birmingham newspaper, which contained a letter written by eight local Christian and Jewish clergy that criticized King directly as an outside agitator and the demonstrations as unwise and untimely. King's response, the first part of which he wrote on the edges of a newspaper, became a blueprint for the philosophy of nonviolence. For those of you who have not read the letter or do not remember it, the eight Christian and Jewish religious leaders levied several criticisms against Dr. King and his nonviolent protests. Well, they admitted that social injustices did exist. They called King an outside agitator. They complained about the tension created by public actions such as sit-ins and marches. They disapproved of the timing of the public actions. They claimed such actions could be illegal and that the civil rights movement was extreme. The clergyman also praised the local police for keeping and preventing violence after the officers set attack dogs on the non-violent children, women, and men demonstrators. While King responded to each of these criticisms, it is his disappointment with the white moderate that draws me in each time I read it. He writes, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. While I'm sure I am not the first person to do so, I have wanted to address this letter for years, not as a white moderate, obviously, but as a black person who has lived and worked with white liberals, moderates, conservatives, and white supremacists for over five decades. Dear Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., it has been nearly 60 years since you were assassinated. Much has changed because of your sacrifices, your faith, and the legacy with which you and other civil rights leaders have left us. Even though I was not yet born when you were murdered, your words still cause shivers in my soul and ignite a passion in my spirit. More black people are graduating from high school and college than when you died. And we have made great strides in many areas of education, industry, technology, the arts, engineering, science, medicine, journalism, politics, and sport. We even celebrated the election of the first African-American president, Barack Obama, a man of integrity, compassion, wisdom, and a great sense of humor. And two years ago, we celebrated the election of the first female vice president, Kamala Harris, a woman of black and South Asian heritage. 
And yet, I suspect that you would be greatly disappointed that since 1968, black people have lost ground in almost every socioeconomic measure other than education. The unemployment rate, which, while down from a few years ago, is higher than it was in your time. And that was before the pandemic that wreaked havoc on people's employment opportunities and was more deadly for black people than white. A report by the Economic Policy Institute, a liberal nonprofit Washington, D.C. think tank, found that only 40% of black Americans own their own homes, a rate 30% lower than white home ownership. The incarceration for black people is three times what it was in 1968 and six times that of white people. Black workers make an average of 82.5 cents for every dollar white Americans make. And while household income for the average black family has increased, it remains only 61.6% of the typical white household. And then there are some things that have not changed at all since the 1960s. You wrote about the lynchings, the dogs, the house burnings, the attack on men, women, and children by the police. That has not changed. Unarmed black and brown people are still being shot by law enforcement and vigilantes. While we don't have an Emmett Till, we do have a Trayvon Martin, who was walking home from the store and was assaulted and then shot by a vigilante who thought he looked suspicious. His murderer got off too. Another thing that hasn't changed is the nearly invisible reports of sexual assaults and rape and other types of violence of black women and girls by police officers with its history going back to slavery. Most people have never heard of the 13 black women raped over a course of six months by former Oklahoma police officer Daniel Holtzclaw, or the dozens and dozens of other assaults by, among others, D.C., Chicago, Texas, New York City police officers. But I think you would be proud of the Poor People's Campaign that you started and now is growing under the leadership of the Reverend Dr. William Barber. I think you also would be proud of Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi, who in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murder, began the Black Lives Matter movement, whose members organized and built local power to intervene in violence inflicted on the black communities by law enforcement and vigilantes. Both movements have captured the fervor for justice of young and older people, people of color, white people. They are truly integrated movements. People are still trying to bend the arc of the universe towards justice. It just seems to bend very slowly and not always in the right direction. There is also a growing number of white liberals who embrace the anti-racism movement, who have, as Emory professor Dr. George Yancey called on white people to do, lingered on ways they perpetrate a racist society, the ways they are racist who are daring to face their racial history, which has placed them where they are and formed their racism. They are facing their privilege, their entitlement, the knowledge of the comfort of being white, and that their comfort is linked to the pain and suffering of black people and people of color. They are wrestling with the lies they have been told and the lies they have told themselves. And as Yancey puts it, they are beginning to understand, quote, the weight of responsibility for those who live under the yoke of whiteness. However, there is also a growing number of what you labeled moderates, 
People who don't don sheets or have swastikas tattooed on their arms or chest or who have never used the N-word, who say they don't see color and even have black friends. People who point to black on black crime and call it a bigger problem than the racism that has fueled economic conditions that breed violence. The people who say affirmative action was discrimination against straight white men. People who are afraid of losing their power and privilege, their advantages and opportunities. People who are afraid of what they have perpetrated. People who are afraid of what they have perpetrated on people of color and what will happen to them when people of color outnumber white people and so will do anything to keep their current position of power. These moderates, these are the moderates who swear they are not racist but call the police on a black man bird watching in the park simply because he asked the person to put their dog on a leash or accuse a young black teenager of stealing their phone that they actually left in an Uber and assault him when he refuses to give up his phone. They are the ones who follow us in stores because, of course, we are all thieves. As a person of faith, I have always trusted in community, religious community, to be the transformation agent of society, and I still believe this is possible. But your prediction has come true that, quote, if today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrele irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. We are living in the 21st century, and millions of people have left the church, and millions more young people do not even consider attending church, even when they have children of their own. You ask, is organized religion too inextricably bound to the status quo to save our nation and the world? I do not know the answer to this. Church growth has stopped in almost every faith tr tradition with the exception of the fundamentalists who members blindly follow their leaders who praise a Jesus you would not recognize, G a Jesus focused on individual salvation and not racial and economic injustices, a Jesus that asks his followers to follow a narrow doctrine and dogma where love of the stranger and compassion for those who are suffering is suspiciously absent. The more liberal church is fighting to keep its members and is so concerned about keeping people comfortable. Keeping people comfortable. The liberal church is so concerned about keeping people comfortable, keeping everyone happy and getting along. It is often afraid of the tensions that surfaces when issues of race and white supremacy are raised. I agree that black people demanding their equality are not the cause of this tension, as the tension for us was already always there. Rather, it is asking white people and comfortable people of color to face these embedded social evils that cause the tension. The most challenging thing I ask myself and those I serve to do is to precipitate that tension in their relationships with family and friends who are not on the anti-racism path, who do not see their own power and privilege. I, too, struggle mightily with unveiling this tension as I serve my predominantly white congregation. I shy away from putting a mirror up to family members. I find it easier to confront strangers than people I know. It takes a vulnerability. This society does not welcome, support, or teach. Dr. King, so often you spoke about the power of love. 
Dr. Yancey shares that James Baldwin, quote, argues for a form of love that is a state of being or a state of grace. Not an infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. He explains that this takes accepting, quote, the racism within yourself, accepting all the truth about what it means for you to be white in a society that was created for you. I'm asking you, he writes, to trace the binds that tie you to this form of dom domination that you would rather not see. Love takes off the mask that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. I often remind myself of Reverend Barber's words that those of us who have in our history the commonality of suffering from hate, we know that those who won the day are those who chose love in the midst of hate. You asked, will we be extremists for hate or for love? I want to be an extremist for love, to leave the safety and comfort of my mass to admit where I have stuffed my pent-up resentments and latent frustrations, where I have been drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness, and have profited by white supremacy and become insensitive to the problems of the masses. My faith calls on me to honor the inherent worth and dignity of all people, but I have been more consumed with my own inherent worth and dignity than that of others. You gave your life so that I might have a better life, a more just life, a more equal life. I can certainly commit to giving my life to love, yours in faith and love, Reverend Dr. Kristen Harper. And join me in hymn 1028, The Fire of Commitment. Oh, 
Thank you, thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much for your message. Well, here we are. Some of us hearing things that we've always known, and some of us hearing things that we didn't want to hear. <laughs> and so it goes. Go forth and live into this day, understanding that to make love work, we must work on the way that we love. Let us look deeply into ourselves and uproot anything that keeps us hiding behind the mask. Let us take the time, take the risk, and make the commitment to wake up from the lullaby of white supremacy. Let us continue to confront and dismantle its hold on our lives, starting in our homes and working our way out. So be it, see to it. Ashe and Amen. <laughs>